Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's ASIN event. Uh, one I've really been looking forward to on varieties of nationalism with Harris Milonas and Maya Tudor. Um, uh, we, we're really lucky to have two, you know, I think, well, genuinely leading um, academics on the study of nationalism talking about a really, I think, uh, provocative uh, uh, a book that will advance the discussion of, uh, um, of nationalism studies. Um, Harris is uh, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University's uh, Elliott School. Maya Tudor is Associate Professor of Government and Public Policy at the University of Oxford's Blavatnik School. I hope I pronounced Blavatnik right there. Um, but without further ado, um, we'll go on and start with the, the first question, as is traditional uh, with our events. Um, uh, Harris and Maya, uh, who are your favourite authors within nationalism studies? Harris, you first. Okay, so <laughs> we hadn't planned who's going to go first on this one. Um, well, I mean, obviously, like everyone who's working on nationalism studies, uh, we have several people we draw on. Um, but I would say that uh, the first book I read, actually, in Greek translation was Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities, like most people who were introduced in nationalism studies through that book. Um, and it really fascinated me, I remember, uh, then. Uh, but since I arrived um, to the United States, I got introduced to the work of Carl Deutsch, mm. who was a big influence on me. And then the way I reacted against David Leighton's rationalist work, not the early David Leighton, but the, the identity information kind of David Leighton. And my first book was kind of a reaction to this um, demand-driven nationalism studies, providing more of the supply side, kind of what the state does. And then I, I was lucky enough to work with Lisa Widin, who also helped me understand the non-state uh, types of nationalism while I was at the University of Chicago. So, so these are some of the main influences, but then a ton of colleagues, including Maya, have influenced me um, since then. Yeah. Maya. Um, well, first of all, this is, I actually found this a really hard question because uh, it feels like it's picking favorites and there are so many great works out there. Um, and I also want to say, you know, huge thank you, David, for organizing. Oh, no, no. Really, it's um, a delight to be able to speak to the community I know that is such, so deeply immersed in these questions and in thinking really at a really important granular level. Um, between of, of, of around questions of how we understand the nation and i think that's a it's a real delight to engage um with this community so if i had to pick one um of course you know benedict anderson's incredibly influential and i remember reading him in um in my first comparative politics class and i remember that we were just about to leave anderson when um i posed the question of whether the nation was an ascriptive identity or not in our graduate class. And then that then an hour was gone as we debated that question. So so I think that was influential. But if I had to pick one, um, it would actually be uh, Making and Unmaking Nations by Scott Strauss. Um, and I think the reason I found that um, so important and influential to me is that he we kind of presage something that I think Harris and I both do in our work, which is to take nationalism not as something to understand as an outcome, but to take the nation and nationalism as something that does explaining mm. for a political phenomenon that is really important, like, you know, tectonically important which is the presence and absence of genocide. And then he says, look, narratives of nation matter for this political outcome and does this long kind of causal analysis, comparative historical analysis of the role that conceptions of nation will play in kind of mass political violence. And I thought, wow, like this is, this is a piece of work that asks huge, big, important questions um, and, and actually takes the role of ideas seriously. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic selection there. Um, 
On to the second question. What literature are you responding to with your book? Well, um, that's a good segue to start talking about it. Because, um, I was going to say, it's well, kind of a big question because you're sort of responding to all of it. Exactly. And in a way, um, the book is a response. Is exactly a response to... Um, what we, what Maya actually just mentioned uh, in relation to Scott Strauss's work, um, a lot of the work we got exposed to while we were undergraduates or graduate students, uh, including you, I'm sure, uh, David, um, was about the the big debates about yeah. where does nationalism come from, is it descriptive or not, um, and while that those debates are obviously still important and we haven't settled them uh, in our book or in any book, I think. Um, I think that at the same, not I don't think, we, we argue in the book, I should say, that at the same time, other parts of political science, sociology, anthropology, um, other fields um, and, and, and um, other social sciences have made a lot of um, contributions um, focusing on other questions, uh, different types of questions, different types of approaches. So um, we, when we came together to start writing initially our annual review piece um, on um, what we know, what we, we know should know about nationalism or what we still need to know about nationalism, um, the point we were trying to drive home was that it's important to study the origins, but there's also a big important question which has to do with the consequences of nationalism. And in a way, we saw a disconnect between the milieu or the groups of people who were debating origins or debating uh, approaches even, right, everyday nationalism versus more top-down approaches and so on and so forth. But then also scholarship that was focusing was actually ignoring those debates was, or if you want to put it nicer, in a nicer way, was bracketing those debates or was agnostic about the result of those debates and was solely focused on um, uh, survey experiments or survey, survey research, um, uh, trying to understand salience, for example, or, of national identities or trying to measure under what conditions um, certain people act or feel a certain way with respect to nationalism and so on and so forth, and often completely um, uh, evading the discussions that the other big groups of people at ASEN or ASN to bring out the other organization I'm involved with um, were, were talking about uh, for decades, actually. So uh, in a way, after we finished the review piece, w when we started thinking about what to do in this element, uh, element in this small book, let's say, um, we we decided that we needed to try to bring these worlds um, in conversation, in dialogue with each other, at, at the very least, and at the very least, make them aware that they're all holding different parts of the elephant that is nationalism. So in a way, we do play with that analogy in the book, as you have seen, or those of you who have uh, gotten a hold of it may have seen um, where we're basically trying to say, well, look, uh, you may be studying salience of nationalism uh, at the individual level, and you may be doing that with really, you know, causal identif causally identified uh, research designs and so on and so forth. But don't forget that your work is actually still related with the people who are trying to understand whether a national community even exists or not. Uh, and you're still connected to people who are trying to understand what type of beliefs are accompanying a particular national identity, what type of um, um, characteristics are aggregating uh, or amalgamating to create a national narrative uh, that will potentially be salient or not in your natural in your survey experiment or what have you. So in a way, we're trying to remind everybody that there is a broader field, regardless of where they're focusing, uh, on what they're focusing on. Um, and the rest is um, 
uh, is not relevant to your question, and I think my is going to cover. But that's that's the the rest is history. First of all, because the book is published, but uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about it. We promise. Yes, it, but yes. that's what we were we were reacting to this disconnect we were seeing, and to the fact that um, almost these fields grew so much apart. We felt that they were actually not considering themselves as all part of the same group of scholars. Yeah. This is it, because what one of the joys of this job is I is I I, I get this sort of uh, eagle eye view of what's going on in nationalism studies. We had an event over the summer with uh, Vinod Gold, who's a neuroscientist. Um, there, there's all sorts of different disciplines that that, that, that that have something to say. Sorry, Maya, do you want to come in? Um, well, I mean, I, I think Harris has, has really said most of or what we are, who are we are dialoguing with. I guess just one thing I might add is that um, that the study of nationalism is unusual in that it is it is spread across so many disciplines. Which David just relates to the point that you were making. I mean, I spent some time with um, evolutionary biologists to talk about you know groupness and the role of groupness and as as a kind of evolutionary um, benefit and you know. So from evolutionary biology to sociology and anthropology, social psychology, political science, even economics. I mean, there, you're right, all of these fields have sub-disciplines that take in some part that attempt to look at this question of what is the nation or what does the nation do? And that is, is in contrast to, for example, democracy or the stage or war, concepts that are actually really much more squarely within political science. It's mm. not that other disciplines don't look at that, but that kind of the preponderance of the work is in one discipline. And that does matter because it facilitates integrative conversations. And I think both Harris and I felt that, I mean, actually, I'll just speak for myself because I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to the study of nationalism. Harris is, you know, I think has, has much more expertise um, in, in kind of understanding these debates. And I, I studied nationalism graduate school, as I said in one of my classes, but I didn't really, um, I didn't really work on it um, much in, in my first book. And so it was really, to my mind, as I began to think about it, and, I, and I'm writing my next book on nationalism and democracy, it, I thought, well, wait a minute, like, what is nationalism? And what, and there, these debates were so confusing to me that I thought, oh my goodness, this is an opportunity, actually. It's so confusing, and if I feel like I'm really confused by this, then I bet you that there are other people out there who are confused by it too. And so the attempt was to try to kind of integrate many of these, um, I think somewhat more disparate by by discipline, but also then by methodology, which is has, I think, some elective affinity with certain disciplines, um, really disparate approaches. Fabulous, well, on to, on, on to the main question. I'm oh, sorry, and I should have said at the start, uh, whether you're on Zoom or on Facebook or on YouTube, if you have any questions, do put them in the chat and I'll ask them to Maya and Harris uh, in, uh, in a moment. But let me ask Mademoiselle and Maya, um, what's the main argument of your book? Yeah, so so I think we should be brief and then we can get yeah. you know, people to, to ask us yeah. and you know, engage with us. But, but there are essentially three questions. Our, our argument is that most, maybe not all, but, but really most scholarship that looks at the question of nationalism can, um, can be related to three major questions, which result in kind of five varieties or dimensions of nationalism. So the first question is, um, does a nation exist? So this question, encompasses much of the, the early debates on the origins of nationalism, how it came to be, the role of elites versus non-elites, um, and, um, and, the, and the various historical pathways through which modern nations um, emerged. And, um, and so that leads to kind of two dimensions, which is elite fragmentation and popular fragmentation. So those are varieties or dimensions one can look at um, and they often move together, uh, but they don't always. So, for example, around her's new book, um, 
Narratives of Civic Duty, which came out last year, looks at not how the nation is differently understood between elites who are relatively unified and kind of the popular segments of society that have national stories. And she shows that those move together in the case of Korea and they do not move together in the case of Taiwan. And so that's a really interesting example that shows how we need to conceptualize these differently because of course you also have recursive mechanisms which a lot of great scholars have talked about. So then there's a second question which is how do national narratives vary? And that, um, and they of course narr vary um, most clearly with respect to this idea of ascriptiveness and we very deliberately choose this, I, this concept of ascriptiveness to get away from what we think are somewhat unhelpful uh, labels of civic versus ethnic. And there's been a lot of research um, and a lot of writing that suggests like civic and ethnic is not a dichotomous category, you know, Roger Smith's work. Um, and then there's lots in that tradition that, that shows that like, you know, no nation is ever purely ethnic or purely civic but that even the same building blocks, so religion is differentially ascriptive depending on whether you're looking at South Asia or you're looking at the United Kingdom, right? So, so there's a contextual aspect to ascriptiveness and that it's also a, um, it's a category which allows for shades of gray rather than just kind of black or white. So that's the third dimension, ascriptiveness. And the fourth dimension is thickness. So when you say, to be a Nigerian is to, how many things can you say? Can you say language? Can you say a region? Can you talk about myths? And so how how highly articulated is the sense of the we? Um, you know, I um, have some Nigerian students in my in my current class and three, in fact, and they, they all disagree on what this is, which I think goes to show you that Nigeria's um, national identity is relatively thin. And so there is variation obviously in this. And then there's a, a third question, which leads to the fifth dimension, and that is, do national narratives matter? So you know, how important is the nation to you? And this changes um, uh, both across space and then it changes within the same space across time. And there's a lot of the more recent work on, um, you know, the a World Cup victory win or a kind of, you know, a, a, a war and the changing salience of nationalism falls in this category. So just to, again, to recap, does a nation exist? Do national narratives vary? And when do national narratives matter? And that leads to these five um, dimensions of nationalism, elite fragmentation, popular fragmentation, ascriptiveness, thickness, and salience. Fantastic. Harris? The only thing to add um, is uh, that in the very end, since it's a very short book, we try to um, provide ways forward for scholars who want to take these dimensions and do more with it. And in fact, that's where a lot of the <clears throat> exciting part would be for us as well. We just didn't have the time or the energy to do all of it together, um, would be to try to find the different configurations and their implications. So different, different uh, degrees of X or Y dimension, how does it interact with different characteristics at the narrative level? How does it interact with different levels of salience? And what type of policy implications do we get, right? And to an extent, I think Maya my, my, uh, may be doing that in her next book in terms of regime type, but other, other people can do that in their master's thesis or dissertations in the future, hopefully. Um, because we do think these are consequential um, dimensions that lead to different outcomes in in real world outcomes. So if, if I if I can put, uh, pick up on that, you 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 got those, those five dimensions: elite fragmentation, uh, um, pop, uh, popular fragmentation, ascriptiveness, thickness and, of national narratives, and sameness of national narratives. If we just say have high, medium, and low for each of those, we, we end up um, with 243 categories. Um, is, is that offering, and that's just if you have high, middle, and low, is that, is that possibly offering too much granularity in, in looking at 
uh, at how we look at na- look at nations. I mean, if, if we if we're putting things into these five dimensional boxes, um, it, 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 do you do, if you're doing that, do you end up actually really with a history of a country rather than uh, a, a comparative approach? Um, well, no, I think that that's a fair question, um, and I think it depends a little bit on what your goal is with with this project. If the goal is to take these five dimensions and then code them on three levels each, then you get these different permutations um, that, as you say, right, run, run amok in terms of the kind of, you lose a lot of the, the parsimony of, um, of just having kind of click. Uh, or, or that, that leads to, I think, clarity of predictions mm. and so forth. The problem is, is that there is not, or th- that I think that the, the place that Harris and I were starting from was that the field is even more in the direction of 243. That is to say, they are looking at 243. And and, and I think that I suspect if you, you talk, got all the scholars of nationalism <laughs> in the room and asked them what are the categories that matter, they couldn't agree mm. on five and three that they would, in other words, they'd push you towards more granularity. And so I think our goal in this was to take what is, you know, very rich understanding of particular nations and say, these are how those very particular and very specific narratives might relate to one another. And um, I think that what the intent was not to say, here's a basis for coding, um, because in fact, you know, as we said, ascriptiveness is contextually specific. So, you know, religion is thought of as ascriptive in the context of India in a way that it's it's not another context. So it's not really comparable um, in that sense. But I think what our hope was, and, and Harris, you know, you should come in here, if you if you want to add or disagree with me here, um, our hope was that this was an integrative platform for scholars to say, OK, we're looking at slightly different things, but here are interesting questions that arise from from these this kind of integrative framework of looking at the, the nationalism scholarship, because the problem we're really trying to solve is too much granularity. Um, and we think we're moving in an integrated direction. Um, I think other questions and other concepts, you might be wanting to move in the direction yeah. of more granularity. But I think that we're very much responding to the state of the discipline here. So uh, I don't disagree because, again, it depends from what direction you see this. So I think from the direction that Maya approached it, I completely agree. But then there are other directions. So there are people who, for let's say a whole range of people have written on the uh, on have written statistically minded let's say papers using the ELF um, uh, ethnolinguistic fractionalization index, um, and for example that index in theory is a very parsimonious way of capturing ethnic diversity, but I think I don't need to convince people in this room that it's not really capturing much, especially comparatively given. I mean, the granularity of what Maya's point was about religion in India versus other places, like, forget about it. I mean, there is no such nuance uh, whatsoever. So, so to an extent, I think with what we're doing, we're, we're going more granular than that. And I'm happy about that, right? Because I wouldn't call it granular. I would just call it contextually sensitive. So basically, it's providing you with... Um, a set of, if you want, almost like a cheat sheet of what you should think about when you're doing a project. What should you take into account before you blindly, you know, or or let's say um, for the sake of parsimony, you decide on one thing that varies in this case, let's say, or one one axis of, vari- or, of variation. So to fix ideas on this front, uh, you can think of our framework not always as having to think of all the things, how they vary. But uh, in other words, not all the permutations are relevant for every scholar. And now I'm going to come closer to the type of way that Maya answered. Um, You can think of, for example, of our first question, does a national community exist or not, um, as something that will operate for a vast, you know, a, a, a lot of scholars, 
as what we, we could call, for lack of a better term, as scope conditions. In other words, to begin with, if you're studying variation in national narratives, first of all, we need to be sure there is that community that has the narrative to study it, right? So, so our first question for a whole bunch of scholars who are only focusing on national narratives, let's say, um, our first question is a, is a scope condition question. It's a universe of cases kind of question. Uh, what can we, you know, what are the units? What's ontologically possible to study? Um, and if you're studying salience, um, we're saying in our framework, you need to think very carefully uh, about the other two questions you've bypassed, right? Mm. Because you're looking at say uh, for uh, you're, you're focusing on salience of a particular national narrative or contested national narratives in a particular setting of uh, a national community being fragmented or not, and so on. So, so, so that doesn't mean they need to um, study these other things and all their variations, but they need to be aware mm. of where the case falls in the global distribution of cases, to speak a little bit in statistical terms, let's say, um, so that they know how to situate it so that somebody who studies Japan and somebody who, somebody who studies Greece or or the UK, they know that they don't need to say, oh, we're studying apples and oranges. They have a framework to say, well, I'm studying a case that is here in terms of fragmentation, here in terms of narrative, here, in the, right? And then it becomes a different conversation. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to start taking questions from the various chats. If you do have any questions, do please um, put them in the chat or if you're in, you know, if you're on YouTube or Facebook uh, or chat or Q&A if you're on Zoom. A question from uh, Jonathan Hearn. Uh, does your model suggest any particularly fruitful comparisons of specific cases? Are there general differences in narratives between more liberal, democratic, and authoritarian regimes? Well, I think Maya should take this, but I want to say hi uh, <laughs> to, to our common friend, I John. Um, uh, but I, I, I would just very briefly say we do allude to some of this in the book, but obviously we haven't done something extremely empirical. Maya is writing a book on this to an extent, right? Um, but but the only thing I wanted to point out from the very beginning of the book, we make it very clear that we do see um, these more narrowly defined, ascriptively defined, to mention one of the dimensions that Maya already mentioned, um, uh, types of national narratives uh, co-varying a lot with these people we call lately, um, for lack of a better term, as ethno-national, ethno-populists or um, um, uh, leaders. And so it's not just the authoritarian democratic divide, but it's also the type of leaders that even in democratic, nominally democratic settings uh, may may push for a more narrow definition, a more ascriptive definition of nationhood. And that would be within the national narrative question that we have uh, highlighted in the framework. But his question is much broader. I'll, I'll let my... Uh, and I, and I should say that Jonathan does say hello. <laughs> Maya. Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so those are really two different questions. I'm going to take them as two separate questions. One is, are there any special um, fruitful roads for comparison? And then there's a question about um, whether different kinds of regimes have different kinds of narratives systematically. Um, so I think the first question is, you know, I think I am probably not, I'm probably preaching to the choir here when I say that I'm really looking for um, deep contextual knowledge of a case and thinking about how you can look at other similar contextual, contextually similar cases that vary um, along some of these dimensions systematically. I think that's a very fruitful area of, of comparison because um, I, we're just beginning to be, I think, in an era where we're looking at consequences of nationalism much more um, as an area of inquiry. And I think that's going to be in a really important area of discussion as we now are very clear um, as both as scholars and as kind of concerned citizens that we're no longer in this kind of post-nationalist end of history world, if we ever were. And and that that we're now at a time where nationalism is, you know, it's it's clearly not going away which I think people did think of, 
think was was happening for you know decades and decades after the end of the the post World War II era. So I do I think trying to um, engage in research and, and encouraging your students to engage in research where you're really thinking systematically about how these how these dimensions vary, but in ways that allow for contextual similarity and and the 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 book that i'm writing right now is about the relationship of founding national narratives to democracy across time and there is a quantitative component to it but but the really i'm a comparative historical researcher and the the, the real causal heavy lifting of the book comes in being able to understand where nationalism is deployed politically um, in moments of crisis and how that that plays out so that brings me to the the kind of Second question of, um, do we think about regime types having systematically different kinds of, of national narratives? I, I actually just want to say, I think that's generally, um, I think that that's not, I think that's not the, the case, um, but that's my my own kind of prior, I would say, um, but not based on a, a ton of kind of research at this point. Um, the reason I say that is because all nationalisms have the potential to be exclusive, right? It, for, surely to non-citizens. And um, liberal democratic regimes, I think, like to think of themselves of having kind of principled, more ascriptive and civic kinds of nationalisms. But, you know, the Soviet Union had a pretty civic kind of nationalism. And um, so I think we have to be careful not to let our priors kind of lead us in, in one direction. That being said, I, I am, I mean, the, the research that I'm doing in South Asia suggests that more ascriptive nationalisms lend themselves to more democratic breakdown more consistently. And I'm looking actually the role that um, of language and religion, and, and actually they play out very, very differently. So language nationalism in the context of post-colonial countries, um, by which I mean the kind of use of a, the adoption of a single national language in what is always a highly diverse um, kind of ethnic and religious context in the post-colonial world that is, is, is definitionally kind of um, exclusive, um, that, that, that that has kind of immediate effects on, on democracy in ways that religious nationalism has this kind of more complicated role to play. And, um, and I'm looking at um, South Asian cases as I kind of make this argument. So, you know, if you're interested, you can ask me more about that. But, but, I'm, um, but that's, that, those are my, um, my answer. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take uh, some questions from, uh, from YouTube. And I'm actually going to put three together, if that's okay, because they, they, they sort of go together. Um, from Alan Pankul Devinov, um, the experience of Soviet state building, how would you identify it? What about the situation with post-Soviet national communities? Um, and then John David Vandervert asks, following on from Alim Khan's comment, in regard to the larger second world and the semi-periphery, how do you see nationalism in light of colonial narratives of correct modernism? And following on or, or, on that from Zeynep Abedova, uh, looking at the broad turn to a decolonial narrative, what's the place of the nation in that context? I know those are three quite broad questions, but they seem to go to seem to go together, I think, reasonably well. You happy to take those? Fab. Uh, I don't know. Maya Harris? Maya, I defer to you, given that <laughs> my expertise um, is in uh, in different areas. Of, well, uh, yeah. Uh, OK. All right. I, I will do a quick. Uh, I mean, those are really important questions. I do a, a, a quick take at each of them. So, so how do I think about Soviet state building and the post-Soviet national? Um, I, I don't know much about this region, but I will say that literally today I was reading um, Mark Weisinger's work on nationalist mobilization. Um, and I think that there's a really interesting puzzle there that, um, you know, maybe 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 somebody here has to say something about. But but in this book on um, post-Soviet mobilization, one of the things that that um, that Mark Beisinger says is that 
you know, ethnic, ethnic protests or protests that mobilize on the basis of ethno-nationalist claims were, were basically much more successful than those that didn't. And um, so, but, you know, so th this is a case where the nation and constructions of nation that are antecedent to the Soviet Union, so he's still going back to pre-Soviet conceptions of national belonging, that where you're able to harness those, you're much more successful in, in actually creating post-Soviet democracies, mm -hmm. right? So there's a kind of link between ethnic mobilization and the creation of democracies. And today, when we're talking about an era of democratic backsliding, the, the same claims are being made about democratic backsliding and the relationship of ethno-nationalist mobilization. So particularly those parts of, of Eastern Europe that are seeing the most democratic backsliding, right? Um, uh, uh, Poland until recently and then and Hungary are those countries in which ethnic conceptions of the nation were being mobilized. So I think it's that's kind of a really interesting set of puzzles. And I, I don't, you know, I think it's an interesting motivation for thinking about the relationship uh, between nationalism and democracy and, and, and actually talking about under what conditions does ethnic nationalism matter for democracy. And I think that the, the second two questions were about both thinking about the colonial narratives and modernization and then decolonizing um, and um, a national narratives. And I, I think that, um, you know, there's been lots of really excellent work that's shown that the D that the ways in which the kind of high modern colonial state saw the indigenous population and categorized the indigenous population um, mattered, right? It still continues to matter for who gets mobilized politically and who doesn't often in the immediate af aftermath of the state, but in sometimes, you know, well afterwards. So, I'm, you know, thinking of the case of Sri Lanka, where, you know, there's this, it's kind of like a Rwanda-like situation, which you have a minority that's that's given patronage by the colonial state and thought of as kind of almost as a nation, um, and then a majority that, um, that, that even though they had come together to, in a nationalist movement to kind of kick out the colonial regime, that they then kind of um, partly because the colonial state saw and reified those terms, uh, they begin to act on the basis of those communities, which of course leads to democratic breakdown in the in the in the um, in the uh, civil war. And in terms of decolonizing, I mean, I think I don't know how I think. I mean, I, I think the question was broadly, how do I think about that? And um, I think to the extent that decolonization. And this is my kind of normative, you know, I'm, I'm taking my like non, um, you know, positivist, but I'm normative. I, I, I do think that having like the, the world absent nationalism, I think is not a good world. Um, and I, I think that's because people need political belonging. And I think because state power, um, you know, like the where the state doesn't have ideational power, um, I think is a state where this is able that's able to get fewer things done and of course the state is not always a positive force and i understand that but at the same time you know um we all remember where we were when COVID hit and the power of our nation states to and i know they're not the same thing but the states to use the na nation na national narrative to get us to do things that really mattered and i suspect we're going to see a lot more work coming out on that so to the extent that decolonization um, I think grounds a narrative of belonging in history and in, in, in essentially thickens the narrative of the nation. I think in many ways, that's a good thing. Um, but I think that, that the real challenge is to thicken in ways that don't exclude. Um, and, and I think there's a really interesting set of discussions to be had about how that actually happens, right? And because that's a very difficult question of policy. But if you think about that, what does it mean to belong to a nation? And if you believe like I do that that's an important thing um, for political stability, then how do you actually get there? And and I suspect, and this is you know where I'll stop, that the way that you get there is not by taking away so much you know, which I think a lot of, you know, I speak to my students all the time about decolonizing the curriculum. And I, I think that the, the impetus there is often to take away um, 
stories, histories, certain monuments. And it's not that that isn't, you know, that there isn't value in that, but, but there's a danger also in that, that you thin the narrative so much that there isn't, that there isn't enough to sh that's shared. And so what I would like to see is rather than a thinning is a pluralization of that narrative, recognizing that there was an exclusive history because that's also part of the story of the nation, but also to tell those stories in ways that also then, then recognize, um, you know, that our societies and our nations um, um, are pluralizing, if not have always been plural. I mean, I don't, I, I, I will, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, no, go ahead, Harris. Um, now that Maya has unpacked her thought, I think I can add a couple of things. Uh, if by decolonizing, I mean, first of all, in the book, we, we explicitly have as one of our goals to go beyond the Eurocentric approaches to nationalism. So from that perspective, I think if I understand the questions correctly, because a couple of people mentioned them on YouTube, uh, the colonial perspective, um, I think we're trying to do that in two ways. First, by looking at people, people's research from the areas that um, that we're uh, talking about in, in the book. Uh, so what, that's one way to take into account more, let's say, indigenous perspectives. Um, um, broadly defined uh, of certain, you know, experiences with nationalism. But I think also by, for example, delinking in our definition of nationalism, we're delinking nationalism and its definition from ethnicity, for example, which is a very specific perspective that comes from very specific, as you know, intellectual heritage and understanding of the world. And we talk about nationalism and we define nationalism in a less ethnically based one. And we, we have a question coming up about where we what, what stance we take on the modernist uh, debate. But in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm prefacing that answer. But uh, to, to finish with the decolonial narrative, the other way we are, um, let's say, providing maybe tools or aligning ourselves with this you know, uh, initiative or project or however you want to call it, intellectual project, um, is that I think going back to our granular approach, right, or uh, maybe too granular, I think by going into the micro foundations of power, the micro foundations of nationalism, by looking at these three important questions and then disaggregating them in terms of different dimensions and how they vary and whether the popular fragmentation exists or the elite fragmentation exists. By necessity, you have to look into what Maya talked about as um, the, the, you know, the contextual aspect of nationalism. You have to look at how the people who were involved in whatever interactions with colonial authorities or what have you, depending on the different areas, um, to what extent these were oppositional, to what extent there was a joint production of certain um, narratives, to what extent this was, uh, there was collaboration by certain aspe uh, uh, parts of, of the indigenous community as there was, for example, um, in, I'm speaking from my knowledge of the Ottoman context, for example, I mean, there is no doubt that people who later on became Greek nationalists at some point were collaborating, obviously, and prominently with uh, the Ottoman authorities as um, uh, they they held really important positions in the Ottoman Empire and so on and so forth, right? So, so these things um, can only be um, unpacked if we become more granular and we don't bracket, you know, everything and say, oh, now I'm only looking at the salience of the Greek national identity. Well, yeah, but how, how did this come about? Is this a joint production only of the interaction with the Ottomans, or is it also a joint production, as I argue in a recent piece I'm, I'm writing right now with a historian from Greece, Elpida Vogli, that it's also a joint production with the Greek powers that supported the Greek War of Independence. So when we think of decolonial, it's not only decolonizing the history by taking into account the, the, the indigenous perspective let's say the Greek perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman, which was a colonial at the time for the Greeks, but it's also um, understanding what are the, the, what's the impact of the great powers who were purportedly helping the Greeks get their independence, but in the process they were also shaping what it means to be Greek. Mm 
by giving loans, for example, no offense to the Brits, but the Brits, the British loans were really important for the Greek Revolution. And if you don't understand how that um, dependence of the Greek revolutionaries on financing from the British at the time and how that influenced, going back to Jonathan's question, their liberal turn or pretending to be more liberal than they were actually, maybe even at the time, in order to get the support of the British uh, Empire at the time, right? So, so all of these things can only be unpacked if, um, if we have a more granular approach. And if we look into the sources from the areas that, uh, you know, including our cavalry sources uh, of the areas that we're studying, right? So it's not easy, uh, but it's something that is happening more and more. And I see it also as an editor in chief of nationalities papers. We get a lot more uh, works that are utilizing um, indigenous archival sources. And I think uh, it's doable. So it's not just um, uh, an aspiration, I think. Now, the book doesn't go into great empirical depth right now because it's more of a theoretical framework, but I think uh, whoever reads it will see that that's the direction we're pointing to. Both Maya and I are doing this type of work in our own respective regions. I mean, that, that, that is certainly, I think, something that comes through in the book, both the, the, that you're trying to get away from the Eurocentricity of case studies and so on, but also sort of some of the normative implications that come from Europe or you know, European nations being seen as the default. And I think it's quite clear you try you try to get away from that in the you know getting away from those biases in the literature. Um I am now going to go to Eric's question. I think I have to. So from Eric Storm, um how do you position yourself in the origins debate? Do you support the mo the modernist position? And let, let let me ask a second question. Does it matter for your framework? Do you want to take it first, or should I should I take it? Um, thanks, Eric. Um, well, the I'll start with the second one. I, I I don't think it matters for the framework, insofar that uh, I, or apart from the fact that it matters whether you agree or not with our definition of nationalism, right? So, our definition, as I already mentioned our definition of nationalism is trying to delink nationalism from ethnicity that doesn't mean it doesn't think of nationalism as a group identity but it doesn't necessarily think that it needs to be based on ethnic uh, characteristics for nationalism to or for a nation to exist um and that i think by itself puts us squarely in the modernist camp uh from a from a definitional point of view Having said that, we are not blind to the fact, in fact, the dimension of ascriptiveness uh, is a dimension that we have in terms of the national narrative, is a dimension that would capture whether a particular nation or a particular national narrative of a national community, to use the terminology of the book more precisely, um, would uh, could be squarely uh, built on ethnic characteristics and could be very much fitting uh, the ethnic origins of nations kind of approach that Anthony Smith and others had, or a more ethno-symbolic approach. So, so that doesn't mean, though, that that is more of a nation for our mm -hmm. framework than a nation that is not building on such um, um, rich history and, and, and pedigree, let's say, in quotation marks. And in a way, we're trying to, if you want, uh, have a definition that equalizes nations in the eyes of the beholder and not creating a, a, an implicit hierarchy of more legitimate or less legitimate nations uh, on the basis of how much they claim or how much they can legitimate claim, legitimately claim that they have some ethnic uh, origins. I don't know if Maya agrees with that, but that, that, I think, was the spirit with which we wrote. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to add a few things, and I'm going to be, I think, probably a little controversial, but, you know, uh, it's a part of a good discussion. So mm -hmm. I, I think that um, it is that, that the, the Smith-Gellner debates on this are incredibly Eurocentric, and that if you use a genuine, like, if you look at the rest of the world, I think you have to be a modernist. 
uh, because, you know, I mean, like to take the country that I sit in, you know, Winston Churchill family said, like, India is no more a country than the equator, right? Like, he's like, this is a motley crew. And yet these nations, this is a nation that is called into being, you know, by a group of indigenous elites, you know, yes, harnessing history and so forth, but they don't, you know, they don't harness an ethnic past, um, really, I think. And, you know, I'm happy to go toe to toe with any historian who wants to, who wants to take me on on that. And I know that there is a debate about that, but I, I just think that it's, um, so decolonizing nationalism studies, I think means accepting to some degree, um, some of the modern claims, that, in the modernist claims. Now, I don't think that, I think, so I would put it like this, that, that most nations have belly buttons, but you don't have to have a belly button, right? And, and we can think of lots of, lots of nations um, that don't have belly buttons. And, and, and so that's how I would put it. And, and what it is in a belly button itself is contextually specific. So I think our framework, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't um, necessarily have to, uh, our, it, our framework and our, the argument of our book doesn't push us in a distinctly modernist or primordialist direction. But I think if you take decolonization seriously, I think you have to think about the fact that so many of these post-colonial nations are, you know, created in a relatively short period of time, sometimes using belly buttons in the, in the, in the, in the speak of the time, but, but not always. And um, that's where I would, that's where I end up on it. Uh, David, I have, there is, um, I forgot to intervene and there's this, Second question or, or a follow up uh, to Maya that I forgot mm. to add. Hey. Maya mentioned something that triggered some people in terms of uh, you know the positive, the normative point of what that's made about nationalism, and uh, the way I would put Maya's point would be slightly different in the sense that I see nationalism because that's a that's linked to the previous conversation, especially about decolonizing some of these discussion. Um, nationalism i don't think maya or i see nationalism as an absolute good in any way right so it's all relative to what are the alternatives as churchill said about democracy for example uh famously uh but at the same time you know so if you think about it i often think and i when i teach to my students the concept of nationalism and trying to talk about its empirical duality as both you know having brought about liberal revolutions, but at the same time mm. has actually led to genocide and other, you know, terrible things. Um, I often remind them that uh, at the very beginning, humans were actually much more, they were extending their solidarity to their, you know, family, and then maybe at their clan and maybe their, you know, villas and so on and so forth. And in a way, nationalism is uh, the broadest solidarity community that humans have come you know managed to create that produced quite effective collective action uh often for good unfortunately sometimes also for bad uh and the question is do we have alternative narratives or alternative ideologies that can bring about collective action at the such a wide level um cosmopolitans would say well maybe we can have a world government well if that is possible Potentially, I could become uh, a follower of that, but at this moment, it doesn't look likely, right? So, so it's all relative to what. So these debates, the normative debates, have to be contextualized and have to take into account what's feasible at the moment, given the technology we have, given how leaders work and how our current system works. And from that perspective, it's not about an absolute good or an absolute evil. It's about can something do what nationalism makes people do, like pay taxes or produce public goods and so on and so forth? Uh, can some other ideology, religion did it for a long time for many people and for many communities, but it then stopped being as able uh, uh, in doing it. And nationalism kind of, I see it as taking a, its position as a civic religion, as Rousseau would put it. So um, I, I would just contextualize this you know, normative debate. 
I suppose it's, uh, I, the line I used to use was, nationalism is neither good nor bad, it's powerful. Um, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's that, and it, and it can be used, you know, or, or it, it, it's used both intentionally and not intentionally for lots of different purposes. Uh, and and it, it's, I think the, the I mean, I suppose the, the other one that people have thought at various times might be the alternative of organising principle is class. Um, and, and, you know, apparently the revolution is coming any day now. Um, but, uh, as you say, until then, in, in terms of the, the, the world that we're in, um, that <laughs> there is no alternative, it seems. I mean, I, I, I'm going to take another question, um, if you've got a couple more minutes. Um, question from Peter Chung. Uh, when reading your proposed three questions in a row, it reminds me of Croc's three stage theories. Do you think this reflects the temporal dimension of nation building from scratch? Uh, yeah, the three phases of Miroslav Kroch. Um, that's a good question. Um, we haven't directly addressed this uh, similarity, although it's not perfect similarity because um, in a way, Kroch is talking about ethnic mobilization and mm. successful success succession from existing states and um, is trying to understand, I'm saying this for people who don't know Kroch, but uh, clearly the person who asked knows this. Um, the, the point there is to see whether we get from the phase A to phase B of agitation and phase C of actual successful mobilization of a broader community of people. Um, in a way, I would say the three phases of Kroch would all be more or less in our first question of does a national community exist? Because Hroch doesn't really get into, and in a way it's a good last question to remind people why our book is and our framework is important because automatically now it gave us an opportunity to show, oh, Hroch is one of these people who's holding the foot of the elephant, right? Let's say, and he's asking the first question. And, and then once, you know, the Estonians managed to successfully, you know, do what they were doing in Hroch's book, then we can start studying their national narrative and what type of narrative that is, right? And then, uh, and then salience becomes a, the third question. So, so in a way, that's that's kind of our goal is to be able to have this heuristic of being able to situate existing important works in different mm. um, um, parts of this framework, so that we can situate them and then kind of try to be able to piece them together. If, uh, as a, as teachers of nationalism or as scholars of nationalism who want to integrate things. Yeah. Maya, did you want to come back on that? No, I think Harrison did a beautiful job, so... Okay, I think so. Ju ju just two more questions. Um, so from Hans Siebers, um, dear Maya, I appreciate your nuanced view on nationalism. On the one hand, it's unavoidable exclusionary impact, especially on non-citizens and migrants. On the other side, what is on the positive side as to its consequences? My work is on the impact of nationalism on society and institutions like the labour market, the economy, or education, healthcare, etc. In none of these institutions I see a nested role for nationalism to play. Nationalism in the labour market has only destructive or disruptive effects. So what remains on the positive side, so to, so to speak? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So I would point um, Hans to the work of Ted Miguel, his 2004 World Politics piece, in which he's really looking at the role of education. Um, so somebody's looking at the provision of education, for example. I'm going to just go to a very specific example that I think shows the role of nationalism as powering. Um, different kinds of collective action. So in Miguel compares uh, Tanzania and Kenya um, and the role that their respective national leaders um, played in constructing their respective national narratives. And so the first thing I would suggest is really broadly is that um, this I think points to a more general role that nationalism plays in constructing good outcomes, which is across the post-colonial world, you know, nationalism was harnessed by indigenous elites to create regimes that were far less extractive and far more representative of their citizens' interests than colonial structures. And nationalism 
was absolutely crucial in mediating that. The second is that, you know, what, what Ted Miguel shows in his article is that the elites, that the, in particular Neri in Tanzania, creates a much more inclusionary narrative of belonging that supersedes ethnic identities, whereas Kenya does not. And he shows that as you go within Tanzania to more diverse districts, so where you know where you have more inter-ethnic diversity, um, you actually do not see a decline in investment in public schools. Whereas in Kenya, you do see that. In other words, people are more likely to want to invest in schools when it's for people like them. And so I do think that you know nationalism and and you know in the West, I mean I think we it's easy to forget this, but you know, many, I think there's even evidence that the most of um, kind of public programs of healthcare um, arise in periods after um, massive wars. And, you know, it's, so on the one hand, there's been a war. On the other hand, there's real, the solidarity is used to power the creation of public good. So I just, you know, I, that doesn't mean it can't be exclusionary. Of course it cannot, it can. It can. Um, but, and I think this just, just to harness, it links back to one of Harris's earlier points. You know, what are the identities that we have left that are bridging across these really mass, uh, you know, the, it, I would say increasingly um, more granular identities. So let me just, you know, an anecdote here. When I poll my students, I teach a class on, uh, identity and nationalism and the future of democracy. And I asked them to do a poll at the start of that and asked my students, um, you know, what, what is your most important political identity? And nationalism was one of the options, but then they have five others and then they get to choose. There's also an option of other. And I run this poll now three years um, in a row and every year, like, almost everybody, in one, one year, everybody, and in other two years, almost everybody gave only two answers. One was nationalism and the other was other, right? So religion, gender, sexuality, like these are not big bridging identities anymore. And these are, you know, these are kind of mid 20s students. And so I think we just also want to think about the power of nationalism to bridge, I think is a really important power. Well, so I have just talking of uh, setting up health services in the wake of wars, I have just bought tickets to go and see Nye at the National Theatre in London, uh, which is about Anari and Bevan and the founding of the British NHS. I'm going to ask one last question before we finish. I think it's fair to say that the book sets out or sketching out where you would like the field to go, where what you think would be useful, a sort of useful set of approaches to, to take. Let's say that we meet, we meet up again in five or ten years. Consider this an invitation for, um, you know, uh, varieties of nationalism too, with a vengeance. What would you like, how, how would you like the field to have developed in that time? Harris. Well, I, I think there is, first of all, let me say, I think the field is doing great. I mean, it's doing fantastic work. There is fantastic new work coming out. And in a way, we didn't, I don't know if we gave the wrong impression, we didn't write the book because we thought there was no good work on nationalism. It's primarily um, a reaction to what we thought was not enough um, cross talk or cross collaboration between very dynamic different fields. So the everyday nationalism uh, subfield is really dynamic and does fantastic work, but rarely interacts with the people who do fantastic work on salience or on um, field experiments, let's say, or top down approaches. Right. So so we were primarily there as uh, synthesizers, as uh, nation builders, so to speak, <laughs> of the field rather than um, at least I never saw the field as a field that, uh, or uh, the field broadly defined of nationalism studies, the field that studies the elephant as a whole, as, as having problems. M m the main problem we both identified had to do with the fact that, well, two facts actually. One, that they didn't integrate, they didn't uh, speak to each other, they almost had parallel lives, lively 
healthy, vibrant lives, but parallel. Um, but and the second uh, thing that Maya w made me more aware of, um, and we ended up writing on, had to do with the fact that other disciplines were not usually thought of as within our field of nationalism studies, have found many interesting things that we could benefit from like psychology, social psychology, or economics, or uh, anthropology, or political philosophy, political theory. So we tried to do the integration both of, or try to give a, let's say, a common language for everybody to kind of find a way to discuss across those subfields of national studies, but also urge people to read more broadly in within other disciplines so that we can all benefit in the future so maybe the second is the more um prescriptive right maya yeah yeah i i agree, agree with with all you said there harris um i would just answer the question by analogy um so to a different concept that is a well furrowed concept and that is democracy so when you talk about democracy today, there is a clear recognition that um, that the definition has evolved over time, that different scholars mean different things when they say that word. And so it's incumbent upon scholars who are going to try to speak to other scholars in the field to do some uh, excavating work at the start to say, here's my question, here's how it situates broadly in the fields of nationalism studies. And what we were trying to do is create a framework for people to do that. That doesn't mean they can't have their lively, rich debates, as Harris said, and, and even maybe even primarily, are, there's a role for groups who are interested in similar kinds of things to speak to each other. But when democracy scholars today say, you know, I'm, I'm looking at whether democracy causes X, then um, they say, and this is what I mean by democracy. And I'm not talking about the quality of democracy, I'm talking about elections, and I'm talking about civil liberties, but I'm not talking about, you know, whether a country has childcare. And, and, and that is foregrounded. And what I would love to see is that the field, in an attempt to make that their it's scholars and attempt to make their work legible to scholars in other fields and other disciplines do that work at the start so that you know that that i when i'm reading a kind of an ethnography of you know um of what na nationalism looked like in a particular country that i can kind of I, I have an entry point because right now a lot of that work is it's too far separated from one another in terms of even the discursive terms. And so just doing that work, I think allows us to become more of a community. And that was really our goal. So hopefully we'll be better at talking to each other. Fantastic. Um, that's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you on behalf of ASIN to, to Maya Tudor and Harris Milones. Um, Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, our next thank event is going to be later this month uh, on the 24th, I think it is, um, with Christina Kalouri on her new book on historical memory in Greece. Um, we also have currently the call for papers for next year's ASIN conference on nationalism and memory. Uh, that closes on Friday the 17th, so next Friday at 23.59, uh, UTC. So if you want to get in your abstract, all the information is at asin.ac.uk slash conference. And the uh, Dominique Jacques Verdal essay prize is currently open as well. Information for that is on our website. Um, with that, I think the last thing to say is thank you very much to, to Maya and to Harris, and we will see you at the next ASIN event. Thank you very much. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thanks. Well, thanks Bye -bye. to everybody who joined. Yeah. Recording.